This month's critical care topic will be ultrasound guided resuscitation of the critical ill patient. I recently gave this lecture at the 2024 Tennessee ASEP Symposium. I'll discuss the diagnosis and treatment of a hypotensive patient using point of care ultrasound. Healthcare providers often ask why I use point of care ultrasound for the critically ill patient. Well, first off, there are no randomized controlled trials with a mortality benefit yet, but here's a good article. Notice the conclusions show that clinical management involving the early use of POCUS in hypotensive patients accurately guides diagnosis, significantly reduces physicians' diagnostic uncertainty, and substantially changes management and resource utilization. I have three main learning objectives. First, to describe the rush exam, then to identify the shock state using POCUS, and finally to determine fluid responsiveness using the LVOT VTI measurement. I will first describe the rush exam. RUSH stands for Rapid Ultrasound for Shock and Hypotension. People recognized that the unstable trauma patient had a protocol called the FAST exam, but there is no protocol for the hypotensive medical patient. This RUSH exam allows for the direct visualization of pathology and differentiation of shock states. This is a typical picture you will get from a textbook showing the four different shock states. However, many people try to memorize this during medical school. I don't want you to remember it this fashion. I want you to think of it in more of a physiologic parameters. So for cardiogenic shock, I want you to think of decreased contractility, valvular disorder, or arrhythmia, which will hopefully be identified on the monitor. Distributive shock will mostly include septic shock in the emergency department. However, anaphylactic and neurogenic shock are two other forms that hopefully will be provided with history and physical exam. Hypovolemic shock includes hemorrhagic shock, but also dehydration, vomiting, and burns. And then finally, obstructive shock, where ultrasound really shines, includes pulmonary embolus, pericardial tamponade, and tension pneumothorax. The RUSH exam can be remembered with the acronym HIMAP, standing for heart, IVC, Morrison's pouch, aorta, and pneumothorax. And we'll go through each of these on the next slides. We'll first start off with the cardiac view in the parasternal long axis view identified here. You will first want to look for a pericardial effusion since it's easily identifiable and quickly reversible if needed via pericardiocentesis. Note that a hemodynamically significant pericardial effusion should be anechoic and circumferential. There are a few exceptions to this rule with post-cardiac surgery being one of them, but for the vast majority of the patients, you'll look for a circumferential pericardial effusion. Next, we'll move to the left ventricular ejection fraction seen here. This is a poor left ventricular ejection fraction as noticed by poor fractional shortening and mitral valve excursion here. And the third one, which is not shown, is right ventricular dilation, most often seen in the parasternal short axis view. Next, we'll move on to the inferior vena cava view. This will be seen in the subcostal space with the probe oriented to the patient's head or to the patient's feet, depending on your preference. Here is an image of a plethoric IBC, one that does not vary with respirations. In this view down here, this is a flat IBC that is nearly completely collapsed. Our goal here is not to measure the size of the IBC, but get an idea if it's big or small. Just from the heart and IBCs alone, you can already start to narrow your differential. Notice that if you have a full or plethoric IBC, this is most likely cardiogenic or obstructive shock. Whereas if you have a flat IBC, this is most likely distributive or hypovolemic shock. Next, we'll move on to M, the Morrison's pouch view. This is a right upper quadrant view to look at the liver kidney interface to see if there's free fluid. Some people advocate doing the entire FAST exam, but I'm more focused on speed, so I only perform the right upper quadrant view. The reason is that if a patient is in shock for intra-abdominal bleeding, they should have free fluid in Morrison's pouch. And I'm often asked, why do you look at the abdomen for patients that don't have trauma? Well, you can have non-traumatic causes of free fluid in the abdomen, including ectopic pregnancy, ruptured AAA, ruptured hemorrhagic ovarian cyst, or more commonly, there's occult trauma, trauma that a patient was not able to tell you about that occurred yesterday or that a family member did not know about. Next, we'll move on to the aorta. Since 95% of AAAs are infrarenal, you'll want to look in the three centimeters that are just above the umbilicus of the infrarenal aorta. You'll want to try and look for an aorta that's greater than three centimeters. Here, you'll notice the aorta is approximately eight centimeters and it has intramural thrombus. If you see a AAA in the setting of hypotension, just assume that the 
abdominal aortic aneurysm is ruptured, POCUS is not sensitive enough to confidently detect a retroperitoneal bleed. You may also see a dissection flap as well. The last area of the high map algorithm is P for pneumothorax. We'll look at both anterior lung zones as seen here to look for lung sliding. You'll notice that lung sliding is present on this side here where there's a rib with a shadow and there's a nice glistening or sliding along the pleural line. The bottom image has no sliding along the pleural line as seen here, but you'll notice as the patient breathes, you can see some of the intercostal muscles contract and the pleural line moves up just a bit. This is not to look for a small or apical pneumothorax. This is to look for a tension pneumothorax. Sometimes you also see B lines, which are lines that start at the pleura and move all the way down to the bottom of the screen, typically down to 15 centimeters, but this would suggest fluid in the alveoli, such as heart failure or pneumonia in the emergency department setting. Instead of trying to perform rote memorization of different shock states as seen here, we can now think of shock states as a more physiologic parameters as seen here. This was modified from the POCUS Atlas, so thank you to them. But notice that the high map findings are on the left side here. And so if you have a pericardial effusion in the setting of hypotension, you likely have cardiac tamponade. If you have no lung sliding in the setting of hypotension, you have a tension pneumothorax. RV dysfunction, mostly it's massive pulmonary embolus, but you could have severe pulmonary hypertension. Hopefully the patient knows about this finding. If you have LV dysfunction with a plethoric IVC, you now have cardiogenic shock. If you have a normal or hyperdynamic heart um, with free fluid in the abdomen or a AAA, then you have these forms of uh, hemorrhagic shock. And then finally, if all of them are negative, most commonly it's sepsis. So if I now look here, we have our forms of obstructive shock as seen here. We have our cardiogenic shock here. We have our distributive shock here. And then we have our hypovolemic shock over here, including dehydration. Toxins and drugs can be a mixed picture, so I won't put them in any one bin. And finally, there was a study that showed if you have a hyperdynamic ejection fraction with a negative rush exam, that's 94% specific for sepsis. So now what? The rush exam is done. You found the patient's etiology of their shock. They're still hypotensive with inadequate tissue perfusion. Should you give more fluids or start pressors? Well, the rush exam is great for diagnosis, but it doesn't provide information on treatment. The next step would be to check the patient's LVOT VTI to determine fluid responsiveness. This concept was de described by a, a doctor, Dr. Blanco in 2015 as the rush VTI protocol. You can go to my next video to learn about the LVOT VTI to determine patient's fluid responsiveness.